Welcome to the second episode of Impossible Human. My name is Carrie Stewart and this series is about the possibilities that we might be capable of as humans, uh, individually and collective, given the massive changes that are happening in the world and given the fact that change is needed anyway. Um, and so this series speaks to human beings who are already doing the work of consciousness expansion from their heart uh, and they probably have been doing it for a long time and now we ask and speak to them for their wisdom and guidance. Um, so we dig into what is possible for, for humanity. So in this second show, I am honoured to welcome Tioka Ghosthorse, a member of the Cheyenne River Lakota Nation of South Dakota. And he has, of course, a long history with Indigenous advocacy. And he also runs First Voices Radio and has been running it for a long time. So you know a thing or two about communicating online, so it's not going to be any problem today. Welcome to the show, Tioka How are you doing? Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, it's good to be here and to the audience and let's get comfortable. Absolutely. Yeah, I want to start asking you um, about uh, indigenous culture. So I'm, I'm Peruvian by birth and in Peru, I've been studying with uh, some of the indigenous people from Peru. There is something called the Andean Cosmovision and the Andean Cosmovision is, is in fact just a way to work naturally, to be in the flow of nature, to be with Pachamama, to be with Earth. Um, and I hear you speaking a lot about the indigenous thinking process, uh, which I think is the same alignment. How, how, can you explain a little bit to us what that means? Well, the whole idea of that process doesn't really exist, excuse me, in our languages. And I have to explain things in noun form and formulation, um, which is very foreign to, uh, that thinking is foreign to the Western Hemisphere. But when I really in the practical mystery of our language, there is no concepts. There are no concepts because everything is in motion. Everything is sentient, even the rock um, that people think that you have to be green and thriving to be sentient and feeling. Well, we know that the eldership that we have in, in relationship to the rock, to all the other things that are on the surface of, of the earth are actually alive. Why not? These things are or have always been alive. So when I talk about cosmovision and the indigenous thinking process, I'm actually extending that from the center of being because in, in the way of Lakota, and I'm sure a lot of indigenous folks, is that the center of the universe is everywhere. And so we cannot just say it's in that church or it's out there or anywhere. Um, and therefore our languages need to be relatable uh, in other words, they, they are in relationship with all that is, rather than, <clears throat> rather than, uh, I would say, um, the rationality of it. It's kind of like if you <clears throat> understand calculus, there is not, we're not looking for the truth or the, the falsity, right? We're looking for the validity of what is already there. Therefore, we have to acknowledge what is. And when I think about indigenous thinking processes, it's the cosmovision within, and that's much larger than what we see with our eyes and what we can touch and tactile, whatever, you know. And so the language I'm speaking now it is more or less dealing with only what I can touch and what I can prove and, you know, prove it's alive or dead to me. So we're in the cause and effect of this. And the indigenous thinking process does not have a cause and effect because everything is, is, is um, for lack of a better term, is metaphor. Um, and in that world of metaphysics, there is no cause and effect. It just is, and constantly moving in motion. And, and the consciousness of that is, is the languages that are relationship to, to that which is all sentient to us. And so when you grow up with that, your, your world vision, your world cosmovision is it's much different because you feel like the source is not out there somewhere. It is, in a sense, but it's also in here and emulates from within, not just the heart language or head language or the left brain or the right brain or masculine or feminine and all that division duality. In fact, it, it's in that world that we, we, we are from, actually. There is none, no need to divide anything 
And we can say we're all one, but that, again, a bypassing that we need to understand relationship, to understand why we are all one in the end or in the beginning, if that makes sense. Um, so in that time capsule of indigenous thinking process, this is a continuum that wasn't just that we had to go to school for. We were born with it, and I think most people don't understand that, that we were born with that knowledge. Um, but we tend to conceptualize it and, um, how do you say, intellectualize it without the intelligence of understanding. So we're all about uh, uh, gathering information and knowledge and books and holding the data, so to speak, over others so that we can validate ourselves. And yet I do know from being with elders that are, are much more knowledgeable, much more experienced with this process that they too know that we all have different perspectives with the earth. And as you probably heard me say, Carrie, is that peace with earth is much broader and vast than peace on earth. And and, and I do know from, from traveling into South America, various places, that they too have a relationship of, of uh, midako yoyasi, which means, um, this doesn't mean we're always related, but it, it actually, you, you extend it in your, your, your beingness to all that is to, to communicate with you. The languages that we speak have no concept or word for domination. And that dogma does not fit the earth because the earth is always changing and always moving. And um, yeah, that's, that's the thinking process that I think Lakota comes from is that we do not have a word for or concept for domination. You see, so I think that would be to describe that process. It's interesting that you speak about language as well, because again, in my experience, when, if, when I ask the people I work with, have you got anything written down? Or often they're asked, you know, is there, what's your philosophy? Uh, or, you know, what's basically the dogma behind this? And there isn't one because it's inherent and it's just it being in flow with the earth. And so there isn't really a, a written set of rules around it. That's the difference, I think, growing up with respect rather than rules and regulations. Um, to be a good citizen was beyond me, even the value of money, I didn't know, really understand it until 14. Maybe a lot of people could say, well, I didn't understand it, we still don't understand it. But just the structure and the system that was set up for um, did not fit the conduciveness of native cultures. And there were civilizations which looked for good citizens. And I, I, I was part of the boarding school generation where, you know, to, to ki kill, uh, uh, to, in order to, well, what do they say, kill the Indian and save the man. That was, you know, get rid of culture so that you become a citizen and you can follow the rules and, and obey uh, as much as you can and give back to that system. Well, it was di very difficult and still is at times. Um, I began to understand the constructs that were meted out in the sense that, that they were, um, had to be built with a beginning and an ending and everything had to be in order in linear structure in order for something to be understood. And that, that's what books are for. I have plenty of those. Um, the education process was built upon the beginning and ending and uh, truth or falsity, right? In the world that I understood before I came into the system is that it's based on respect. And that respect is about culture and culture is of the earth rather than civilization that's built with uh, rest, uh, rules and regulations and the civilization of it, right? Civilize the, the, the culture, but you really can't put those two together unless you have culture. And culture is not just plastic things. And, you know, we blow up uh, 4th of July, in, in this case here in this, the States, is that they have a mock war, they blow up fireworks, and then they kind of spread what is bad about America. Well, the rest of the world did it. You know, so therefore it gives us the right that we can do anything we want. And we see that that attitude gets in the way and we have various words. Um, I, I'm pretty sure throughout uh, the Western Hemisphere with Native peoples about the behavior and 
And Lakota is washichu, one who takes too much, right? We can say, well, it takes the fat, but there's a whole story behind that. Um, other nations say windigo or wetigo, and it's disease. It's, it's a um, disease of the spirit. Um, and so when, you, when you're not paying attention to that cosmovision, that cosmology inside, only the rational and the good citizenry come through and you, you want to get all you can while you can, regardless of the cost to others. You got, as long as you get yours, then, then you are the savior, the, the God, and people look up to you because of that so-called prestige of having more, knowing more than other others, basically. Yeah. I feel like one of the blessings of the time, of course, it's a difficult time for humanity right now, but within that, there are always blessings. And one of the blessings of the time is that there's a yearning in our heart and also a very practical need to change. And there's an opportunity there. And what do you feel the opportunity is for humankind right now that you see in the current, the current way that things are? Mm, yeah, it's a good question. Um, there are various types of, um, I wouldn't say opportunity for me, I would, because that, that is a very formulated word in this system for Native people. Um, take the opportunity to get within the system, get your education. That, that's fine and dandy, but you know, having that, uh, walk that route, so to speak, I, I do know that there is more, more, more than opportunity, that there is optimism in a sense that you can look at places where you can be cynical, you can be critical, you can be intelligent with, with what you have experienced and, and put that together as energy and go forward because, you know, you know uh, in the long run it's about the continuance. Are we keeping the generations moving? The earth is all generations. It's just not one, uh, the seventh generation or the youth generation or the old generation. That's fragmenting everybody. So we don't have in the old way uh, we don't have the divisions as such so we can you know uh, delineate or even um, uh, how you say in science to, to to separate science means to separate actually when once we are fragmented we're, we're trying to put it all together an example in this country would be the current system maybe it's throughout the world where individualism is that severance and actually from our spiritual umbilical cord. Um, a lot of nations, especially indigenous, don't have the word I as a centerpiece of being. The I is a noun in English, and yet we approach it as if it, as it is, is a, you are a verb. I becomes a verb. And so you have to be in relation and emotion with all things. So when I think about the the opportunity or uh, the options. Um, it's not that, that it's freedom of choice because once you know who you are, you find out that everything becomes uh, or everything is in front of you and you have the whole world, if that's what it is, a universe to learn from, to observe, to watch, especially to listen to. And I'm not just talking about humans. I think Extinction Rebellion has has understood a little bit of that, but they, again, need to, to um, or, uh, organic, how do you say it, to be more organic with not just religion or dogma or what we can do to fight the system, but we, what we can do to be with the earth, as Native people have always been, being with the earth, to communicate with the earth, because that's our cosmovision um, and our uh, optimism, you would, I would say, because elementally, these are consciousnesses. All the elements that the fire, the water, the earth, the rock, the plants, the animals, the birds, all, all of these elements, basic life put together, make life. Not just fire by itself, or they all need to be related. So when I say that, most people go to where, why do they have Kelly? Uh, uh, intelligence and consciousness is because of this is they short story is they decided that yes they needed uh, hu human beings to help the process of living here but we were the last ones and our, our job and response responsibility was to learn how to live with the earth so when when the time of uh, 
optimism came, I would say that's a broad word right now, but optimism comes is that we understand that intelligences and consciousness of all the elements are, are coupled or put together in us as humans, as well as the animals, all those, everything is, is, is that relationship. And they are intelligent and they live within us. They make us up, right? So our intelligence comes from that. What we do with that is we tend to intellectualize that we're supreme to all that, that stupidity. They don't have consciousness, that's not intelligent, and yet they live within us. The, the, the thing to know about intelligence is that we, as a makeup of a human being form, cannot live in fire, we cannot live in water, we cannot live in a rock, we cannot live in a tree, we cannot live in an animal or a bird. We cannot live in those things. So, but yet this is how we treat those things, that elemental intelligent consciousness, right? And so I think that's where the disconnect comes with the Western world, and maybe even possibly Extinction Rebellion, is we're not taking Earth as serious as she, she takes us as serious, you see. And I do know that native, native um, languages come from each locale around the world. And that, that locale, that particular part of the country, particular part of the country is that that language that of the Lakota, for instance, my people, uh, was, was taught to us by the earth, by the birds, by the trees, by all that is. Therefore, you find the sounds of that area and the intelligence of that area. And, and once that's in communication in relationship to all the other intelligences, languages of earth, then, then we begin to understand what that collective consciousness is about. And things like Extinction Rebellion, things like, like um, this extractive system that, that's eating the earth now, will not exist. We won't even be having environmental meetings because we are, we are living the environment, basically. And there won't be a word for environment or nature, you see. So it's, it's almost, Carrie, that we, we kind of uh, advanced... Or, or evolved past the need for nouns. And I think that's where my optimism comes in, is that that's the opportunity, not within a time working or time formula or frame within the Western Hemisphere. We only have five years left, you know. It's like an expiration date. Earth does not have an expiration date. Maybe we do as humans because of our non-conducive way of living in the world, on the earth, so the more we get to learning how to be with the earth, and the generality, of course, we have to really sit down. There should be a whole other discussion before, before we move on to anything else uh, in that broad context of Extinction Rebellion throughout the world. That's what I was going to ask. You know, Extinction Rebellion, uh, in my experience, is definitely a very self-reflective organization. So they, they try to listen, to listen deeply, and to grow and change. Um, and that in itself, perhaps you could argue is intellectualizing, but uh, it's, pro it's probably the only tool that's available right now to, to, to make that change. I'm interested to know from your perspective, you, you, how you would view, how you view Extinction Rebellion in that way. And how, what, what would you say, you know, how, how could the, the way that Extinction Rebellion approaches the climate crisis be shifted? Yeah, <clears throat> I think if, if we are able to spend more time with nature rather than out in nature, we're still out in nature, but we're out of nature at the same time. Um, we often have this, this whole idea that it's up to us as humans, which it kind of is, but it's also up to all the other species that are with the earth. They are They are doing what they can to revive, to you see this happening all over with the current crisis going on with COVID-19, that the earth is, is like flourishing. So people ask me, why, why, why aren't you sad? Jokeson, are you, you get all the, the humans that are going to suffer and I'm like, oh, you're only feeling that now. But my people have been feeling this since you all got here to the Western Hemisphere because of your way that you are you were torturing yourself because you were so disconnected and you wanted to fly to that God who was outer space someplace. Um, 
So we felt, you know, the, all the uh, things that that came to us here is that is that that was our trauma, that was our change, that was our crisis, that was our climate change as Native people. And so we have that long experience with another type of thinking. And then when, when you see how animals maintain and sustain themselves with the climate change, they are actually changing. They're, they are actually changing their, by doing what they're instructed to do. Now, humans, that we, we want the manual how to do something. And that usually comes out of a point of privilege and a right of privilege. I want to know, so you better tell me, because you're older, you have degrees that this system spit out, and that you, um, basically, your, educa your wisdom of it was educated out of you. So we tend to go back to that default thinking of the, the good old glory days of the West, and we're tethered to that uh, rationale rather than the, the relationship. And, and, and I think that the, the animals and the birds that I see they're the ones that are, are leading the charge in the so-called climate change, but it's, it's more or less an adjustment, an adaptability. And that's what I say, because as your people and my people know, that we have to adapt to this language, to another way of thinking uh, that was disconnected almost entirely from the earth, based upon that, that disconnection was based upon a salvation point mentality that somebody outside of you is going to come and save yourself because you didn't know about responsibility. You couldn't do it yourself. You always needed somebody else. And we put up the argument that, well, we're all community. Don't we need each other? Yes, but not just humans needing humans. It's, it's the life forms that need us as we need them, you see. And I think that's a big difference in how we complete our thoughts. And I want to say, Carrie, that um, if my garden, right, People say, well, it's your garden, my garden, I have to talk at that, that lexicon. And, and I say to them, well, I'm growing this and I'm growing that and I'm growing corn and you know, I'm growing my garden. But my Lakota knows, see, and understands that the garden is growing me, you see, and that's where the intelligence comes from. Once we give up control and domination of climate, climate change and know that we have to adapt with it, regardless of what system, voting, government, or money, economic, or science, all dogmatic, by the way, thinks that they have control of the earth and we cannot ever and will never outthink the earth, you see. But then we, we want to always, well, Tiogi said, let's take, how do we do this? Here's that how thing again, package it for me. Bring it back into the system so our system survives. But it's not about, it's about the fox outside of the box. Remove the box and you have the fox. Then you have to remove the fox. And then you start understanding what the earth relationship and symbiosis is all about. You see, and I think you, it, it, we're facing the right direction, but we're on the wrong path, so to speak, yet. There's a lot of conversation in the world right now regarding a, a, a historic um, colonization and uh, yeah, and coming along and taking other people's lands. And, um, and I suppose this is where we're getting at now. And it feels like there is work to do uh, in uniting and a, a reparation work, restoration work. What, you know, and for the world family of different, different families in the world to connect in doing this work, are you saying that how I feel that that's still really valuable work, um, but you're saying right that that work needs to be done within nature and the natural world rather than as a separate uh, project, if you like, that is outside of that. How would you see um, the family connecting and uniting in the work of repair and restorations and reparations? I was reminded of that just as you were speaking, and I, I want to say this in a good way so that so that it's understood in a simple way rather than too much intellectualizing. Um, so today's modern world um, adjusts the environment to, to plant a seed, right? In the other way, um, we plant a seed according to the environment, you see. And the thinking process is, is quite different. It's, it's, it's the opposite. So 
to come between that is generosity. One takes and takes and takes, and through charity and whatever, because if they have too much, well, I'm going to share. But on the other one, it's always about generosity, just giving, giving, giving. So no one's, nothing, no, all life form is not without, because they're always within the cycle of the earth, the economy of earth, rather than how much I've given to you a given reward system. So when I think about how isolated this programming has made me, and I'm cognitive of, of, of the isolation, is it's the languages. Again, Carrie, I'm going back to the languages, is where if, if we start out expecting the water faucet to turn on and water comes out without ever thinking about it, if we turn on the gas stove or even cut down a tree, it's all because we were programmed to say that it's here for us, right? And the way I grew up in, in the earlier years, it was always about asking, asking that life form. And it didn't always have to say yes, you see. And so it was 50-50 most of the time. So it kept us from accumulation. It kept us from consumption. It kept us from assuming that we owned everything. And that, that, deadly, that deadly way of thinking of ownership, proper ties, proper tea, comes from that domination, again, of everything, even ourselves. And we were so separate from ourselves, and I'm totally losing sight of your, your question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how we um, engage in the process of reparations. Oh, yes, okay. It's not about people of color, because that fits the, the system, the racial system that's built within the United States. Um, so I go back to, who are people of culture? And definitely McDonald's and Mickey Mouse and McDonald's and you know Harry Potter, all of those, those Hollywood things, that, that's not culture. Because that's not happening now. You see, they don't know how to happen. Make, culture comes from living in a place and knowing a place for so long that you become the culture of the earth. And this is why I said earlier that when civilizations crumble and die, culture reappears. And this is that time of really looking to those people to have, have maintained and sustained a culture. Um, so that, that, that's an approach um, that we need to talk about that so much more. If I was there and having a group discussion, there would be one person who needs to keep that on track. And even though we're young and energetic and all, you know, in that circle mostly is, is that they think that the youth is going to solve the problem. It, it's not that. Um, the, the, these nightmares, nightmares were there for me as a native person. So, and I'm not so young, but these nightmares are were for me. And I start doing something then, but I wanted to know how it was done with the old, how did we survive this, this until now? You know, how are we going to survive it? So it's really about post-paradigm thinking it's not based in the fear of the past that we won't have, that we have to tether our thought process from that which we had to not something new, but something that's already in place. It's already moving. And we, we have to drop the word discovery, you know, drop the word discovery because it's already here. And earth, earth generations are all of us, right? It's not the youth oriented because if you plant trees, you cut a whole forest down of old trees and young trees, you cut them all down, um, and then you plant all new trees. All the trees are going to grow up young. There's no elders. So everybody's going to fight to whatever without any kind of example from an older tree. And that's, that's the way it is of nature. And this domination thinking, it's not conducive to the earth. The earth is going to take that thought process out of us. So if we go back to speaking of optimism, that's what I'm feeling, the, the, the gladness, I'm feeling the, uh, I don't know so much about happiness, but the contentment of the earth that she's always in charge. So I think th there's more to what you were asking, you know, the reparations, that's a human thing. Um, 
in, in the States, if, if it was possible, if we did get our share of the American pie, then we're, we're kind of uh, neglecting, neglecting that we as Native people, in that sense of thinking this language, that we are the ones who own the bakery, you see. And it's not that we want American, a piece of the American pie. Indeed, there are Natives who are lost, who want a piece of the American pie because they don't know who they are. They'd rather be a good citizen than a bad human, human being, right? So I think it's the distinction of reparations start with self rather than how much someone can give from you from taking something. But it doesn't allow those who, who took from you off the hook. It, it means that you simply need to understand the system so that it's not domina domination of all other systems because it's going to die anyway. It, it has a, its vanishing point mentality or its vanishing point in, in art is that it's getting smaller and smaller and disappearing. And that's where we're at now. It's disappearing. And Humpty Dumpty did not put himself back together with all the help of other human beings, you see. So I'm thinking that in that context, um, reparations will not work. Um, it, it's kind of like get ours and get ours now, instant gratification, and therefore I'm going to enjoy life, enjoy, enjoy the hell out of life as I can now before I die. But that's not enjoying life, that's things controlling you, technology, based on technology, basically. Decolonization has to happen in our hearts, really, doesn't it? That's where it happens. Yeah, thank you for that. It, it's a good reminder to know that decolonization, colonization is not an original native thinking process. That's a formula, again, a, a extreme a duality. Mm -hmm. So once we remove that, we can see it's their problem, not ours. We, we at, for a long time, had to suffer their consequences, and so do we, um, or so does the earth. But now, look who's suffering, and they wouldn't allow themselves to suffer because they still have the guns, they still have the books, they still have the control. We can dictate to you how to free yourself when they're not free themselves, you see. So, wow, yeah. I think many people are working towards that or trying to understand the words that you say I find beautiful and they touch me, but it's also uh, when you have been indoctrinated, if you like, or you've been born into a certain way of thinking, it's, it takes a massive shift within yourself to be able to, to experience a different reality, really. And so in that process, what, what I'm witnessing with many people is that it's painful. It's painful and they don't really know the way and they're trying to find the way and mistakes are being made along the way. So what's the work that you're involved with, with people that perhaps would like to learn from you? Is there work that you're doing? Before this, this current slowdown because of, of a natural thing is that I would travel to various parts of the world and talk to young people such as yourself and, and, and they were looking, searching um, and researching for themselves and, but they were still referring to the system and because it's a system that took them away from themselves by making themselves or by programming them into individualism and isolation. And it, it, it is kind of a sad thing to understand um, the separation, but it's another thing to understand that we as a community, right, is the climate change has already happened within. And we can say this, but then again, I have to refer to the Lakota of Nasula that this brain, this, this, this sensor up here is, is merely and only a, a seed of the heart. And once we know that where a heart is, this doesn't rule over the things that we think we have to default to in our thinking. We must go back to the capitalist system. We must become socialists. We must become all of those isms that have never worked in the Western Hemisphere for Native peoples, at least. They only benefited a certain race, class, gender, basically, in the Western Hemisphere, maybe throughout the world. But they didn't. Because look, that's based on supply and demand of what they call resources. Well, we can't say resources as Native people. 
This is the source. This is our source. And you cannot resource something and think that it's just going to come back and always going to be stored up for us. Like, why aren't we doing reparations for the earth? You know, how come we're not we're following her, her lead and showing us what to do? Because of all the times that we say that we have to go to listen to the earth in order to know what to do, we take our notes and, and, and but we've always forgetting, we're always forgetting that the earth is already listening to us. And, and natives know this, the earth is already listening to us. So we communicate that way rather than I am going to the forest to listen. And this is how we listen without ever understanding that the earth is teaching you how to listen. Right, so I think part of that understanding in, in small islands such as England or Britain, uh, any any island has its own ecosystem. How much of that is being restored? How much of fences are being? How many walls are being taken down? How how many rivers are, are allowed to to flow freely like they used to? In the United States, there are two million dams. It's going to take lifetimes to take all those dams down. And that's interrupting the flow, the veins of the earth is what she needs to do to keep balanced and clean. And that's affecting us, we know as natives, what we do to the earth, we've heard this in cliche, what we do to the earth, we do to ourselves. And we've always known that. We've, that's just not some TV commercial or a book. That's, you, don't, you go in, in among the nations and you don't even have to speak it. Or pronounce it. It just understood. And I think that's what we're missing from when I'm involved in American culture, which is only a symptom of Europe. Europe is the root of all of this. And Euro Europeans, you know, like we're clean from COVID now. No, it's the thinking, the thinking, the climate change, the impact, the pandemic came to Native people from Europe. That whole idea that's spread out all over the place now. So how many of those people listening of you are going to listen to this and really feel that and know it and not feel guilty about it? But look, every moment that we, we go through now, we have to endure guilt if we think that way. But every moment, every second that we go through now is innocent. We have to acknowledge the innocence, right? Not like we're dumb or stupid or that we have, don't have enough education because in that broader context of cosmology, that innocence is the most intellectual, not intellectual, excuse me, intelligent way to be, is acknowledging and being in the present, the akantu, the being of the ancient future now, without be here now. <laughs> that whole saying, what's your takeaway? What did you give away? That's the whole system. And we have to think more in, 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 in op optimism with peace with earth, rather than peace on the earth. See, this, this children can understand that. I'm really glad that you brought up the word, the word guilt, because I think that's something that's preying really heavily on good-natured, well-intentioned people that are trying to find their way. And yet the way is laden with guilt. How do we navigate that? Guilt can never be nav navigated. Because if we look at it that way, then guilt is always going to navigate us, you see. We're giving it being. And won't we understand it that it's not a powerful being. It's just something that, it's, it's a regret. And if we understand regret and we look for, uh, how do you say, atonement or exoneration from what we did to those peoples, it's only that we did it to ourselves in a much worse way, our spiritual being. And we've been taking that spiritual being and putting it into the religious context of dogma. And there's nothing to do with the earth. But once you understand the earth that she's laid, any belief system you think you have as more powerful than the earth, she's laid that belief system flat. We're all on equal footing now. And she's going to control whatever political vote, whatever scientific discovery, whatever, whatever. She's going to do it now. So let's think the earth about what earth is, is allowing us to do. Allow earth to enjoy us rather than us going. We're going to go enjoy the, the nature. We're going to go enjoy the earth. Allow her to enjoy us 
And once we complete those thought processes in our synapses, we'll understand that our heart is feeding more information to the brain than the brain will ever. It's always trying to dominate the heart because it never can. See, the heart is always doesn't have to think and, and be and feel in domination because it's the truth, right? It's the only organ in our bodies that does not catch cancer, you see. So heart language is not just the, the, the sentiment of it or a myth of those native peoples. Is that our languages are from Chante. Chante means treeing, living. Living, treeing. That's what we have in, my, of course, my language. Um, I'm sure a lot of other native peoples refer to ourselves as natural beings with natural law. That's, that's, that's the indigenous wisdom that is, has been lost to some people that is now available to hear. One of, one of the ways that I find that I can allow the earth to listen to me and to hear back is through ceremony. I find the ceremony is a really important way to connect um, through drummings, through circles with other humans in, in nature, when nature is included in that ceremony. Is that something that's close to your heart as well? Yeah, <clears throat> there's, there's something, a distinction that I have to probably say, and maybe some folks will not um, agree entirely with it, but just to know that there is a difference there. Is, is that those so-called spirituals, the spirit spirits, they, they know already, and they'll call you. We, because we've lost a lot of that way, as you say, is that we think that we know, well, this drumming effect is going to call a certain spirit, or that uh, ritual is going to call certain things, but we don't know the communication process anymore. So we don't know who we're calling. Right? So it's kind of dangerous. So, you know, maybe in, in England uh, or any place in the world that, that can hear this, is that have you really lost your language, your songs, your olawa with that part of the world? And are you saying that you are a mystic or you're uh, a medicine person or uh, all of these things that a real mystic, shaman, medicine person, spiritual, will never say? because they just are. You don't have to, to have a degree to know something. You, have, you just understand it. And there are plenty of folks that I know who are indigenous that don't have any degrees. They haven't read a book in their lives. They don't want to read a book because they see the results. <laughs> um, and, and they understand the cosmology. It's a complexity of cosmology so much that they've simplified it. But yet our intellectualism is to say, well, if I have ceremony, if I have ritual, it's, um, it, it seems to be that we, we don't know what we're really calling in. Are we making the situation? So I refer to those who are medicine people, who really are and grow, grown up with that, haven't gone to a class to be, become one, you see. So, you know, maybe in some drum circles, you won't find native people. Because there's a difference in, in knowing that, you know, um, I I know because of my experience that that this is true to a lot of native people that are in remote areas in Turtle Island or the United States, and and we're we're still practicing those underground, and they're not just fundamentalists like religions are. It's more or less that. The earth is calling you to do certain things, and, and if you've kept the language, then maybe we should be following the example of those people who have kept sustainability, a spiritual sustainability, sustainability, rather than making up something, right? Because that's, you make up something, that's like acting. You feel good temporary, and you want to go on to your next drum circle, your next retreat, and... And this is the thing that people think that I'm criticizing that way. No, you're pointed the right direction, but maybe it's the path. The path that, that may go only a sort, certain way, but there are people that have been on this path for since continuum, right? And that's what I'm saying. That's what Earth is calling for. And, and you will definitely know it. It's not a, a realization. 
but more one of a cognitive practical mystery, pra practical mystery that happens. And this word, these, these, this language I'm speaking, can't even go near it. Mm -hmm. Is there a need to find, to connect with that? I mean, I think we're going back to the same question about connecting to our heart, isn't, isn't it? Because in a way, ceremony can be anything that you feel is in connection to your heart. In, in a sense, it, it, ceremony is definitely needed, but not planned. It, ceremony is in not just an instinct, but an intuition. We are always in ceremony, as we say in Lakota. Everything is ceremony, therefore we're always in it. When we formally come together, it's, it's in recognition uh, that these energies exist and have always existed. We never have denied them. Because we don't have control of, excuse me, of these um, energies. We can only petition them, ask them, um, uh, give, give recogn recognition to these energies. And there's nothing to do with authority, you see. So we're looking, at, again, uh, we're, we're guising these ceremonies as a salvation point mentality that something else is going to save us. And yet that ceremony, that cosmology is happening here, not as an individual, but within. If you go within, you realize that it's, it's not about an individual. But we've been stopped by this thing to only go this far and speak about what we can't express, right? So I like to say, just for a tongue-in-cheek, when I was younger, I was learning English and... One of the things was like, oh, why does this word sound alike and yet mean different things? Because I understood here phonetically, real eyes, right? And I thought they were talking about real eyes. Then I thought, oh, there's that, but then there's real eyes. Oh, they, they meant real eyes. And then, the, then you say it slower, it means real lies, you see? So I was thinking, real eyes, real lies, real lies. That's the Western way of looking at it. When I, when I understood it as Lakota, the, the, the meaning, the truer meaning, the etymology of the meaning, it meant that uh, real eyes, oh, excuse me, real eyes, real lies, real lies. You see, it's totally different. So it's, it's real eyes, real lies, real lies. So it's different in the Western way context of seeing it. But... um. Yeah, I think uh, if we take religion out of out of the ceremony, things start to simplify. And I think humans need to be a little more simple with themselves and not so hard on, them, hard on themselves with intellectualizing everything to death, thingifying everything to death, you see, and making nouns. Um, that's another thing, our language. It, if it's of verbs, there's no need for an alphabet. It's that you feel that you you've outgrown the alphabet. To be stuck between A and Z, A and Z, that's where your, your rationale comes from. So you take it out and it just opens up and you find out there are other languages, not just the Romance languages that we're talking about. Because when Columbus landed in the Western Hemisphere, there were more languages spoken in the Western Hemisphere than the rest of the world combined. You see, now think about that. And, and half of those could not understand each other, but the, all of us could understand what it, what it meant to the earth. Do we have meaning to earth? Or are we saying, does meaning have, does earth have meaning to us? You see, it, it's that whole mess of, of, of our languages. So ceremony has to do with, with singing the proper songs, um, saying the proper words, like religion. No, it's not that. It's understanding which song to apply to the wind, to the rain, to, you know, it, and that took a long process of understanding. We just didn't go down to the, the latest shopping New Age store and get ourselves a dream catcher and a drum and all of a sudden we're spiritual. No, that's mimicry. That, that's insulting. And, and so we understand beyond what our brain is, is giving reason to 
we understand that there is spiritual technology that is still available out there, uh, in here, if I could say. It's a really hard habit to come out of, even with the best intentions, I think. Oh, yeah, I know. We will fight ourselves. We'll fight others to, to find place within. I'm spiritual. And then yet that, that spirituality, that warm, fuzzy feeling is blinding us. And we can, we can always say that we, we did our best. We're doing our best to understand um, by reading more or acknowledging more or going back to the box of default thinking. Um, but it's, it's no longer needed. You don't lo no longer need to do your best. You need to do what's required. And the earth needs you to do what's required and get get over yourselves. You know, that's that's our problem. We're too anthropocentric. We're, it's about us trying to solve only our problem. And yet the earth is like kind of like, come on, let's get with it. You know, I'm showing you how I'm saving myself. You don't need to save me. I'm saving you. Let me do that because that's what's happening. I think that's why I'm a little more content because I see that's what she's doing. But as we know that the systems are in place are starting to come back slowly because they want the, the, the uh, how do you say it, the, the tether of the old system, the old world, right? So, yeah. I wanted to ask you, uh, I imagine you pray, uh, and I wondered what you pray to. I, I could say in that sense of, I know what you mean, I don't pray. I recognize, acknowledge, um, and I, if anything, I pray from and I pray with the earth. I'm praying with the tree, with the water, with the air, with all that is. And that makes the prayers more relatable to where I am with the earth. Now, if I go pray to the earth, I'm praying to the God, I'm praying, you know, I'm praying in another way that is over there. So... It, it's a very foreign way of saying, I pray to the earth. No, that, that's worship is, is not even a Lakota word, worship, right? Because it's, it's the way it's, it's built upon that biblical sense of being, we are the image of God in that way. And like, okay, so you're praying to yourself? You know, it, it doesn't make sense because if we're praying to God, then if God created us, then wait, I don't get that. Right, so we, we I can safely say to me that's a myth, because it take it takes us constantly away from ourselves. I'd rather work with, talk with a good human being, you see, and be able to to exchange the knowledge, not not wisdom, but the knowledge in the sense that this comes the understanding that too much knowledge is not good for us. Is that we can go through a world without having to think because we're in the consciousness of it. If you're in the consciousness of life as it is, there is no need to conceive anything. And, and yet I hear the mental say, but we're human beings. We have to think. No, we don't have to think because when you're out there and you understand full consciousness, thinking takes a small part because it's based on rationality and reason that comes out of the Western democracy, out of Greece. And, and we want to always measure up the standardized thinking is the Western Hemisphere, or no, excuse me, is the West, the, the Europeans. We're supposed to always, everything from art to beauty to science, to, to, you know, to religion, to government, is always standardized towards them. That's the box I talk about. And in, my, in the world that, that we grew up in, it's much different than that tiny box, right? So outside of the box is, is saying that you... If you're believing a system, you have to believe that the system is within a system in order for them to seemingly work. But if you're you believe you're always about believing something, then you don't you don't even think. You can't even think. You're just accepting a belief system. We as as native people aren't trying to solve the mystery. And we're not going crazy. Now, religions and all the sciences and all of those logic-based, whatever, are trying to solve the mystery. And it makes them crazy. It, they're making people crazy. And you can see it all over the world. They're trying to solve the COVID. They're trying to solve a problem 
We're, we're not treating COVID as a being as and giving it respect and saying it's part of nature. We have conspiracy theories. We have conspiracy theories about everything. We even have new psychological modems or how do you say it, uh, modalities of, about how oh, we've never experienced before, but those experiences of, of suffering have now come from the privileged. It's, it's a first world problem. We made something that's so organic into a problem, a first world, because we're kowtowing to the economic system of the first world by getting all the products to prevent our death because we're so f afraid of dying that we'll continue to do what we need to do with the system because we don't know any other way. And if I had expect, if I could explain in, in, in words that, you know, that I probably can't say on the radio, well, that, that's all part of it. Express yourself from the heart, not from the head saying, oh, that felt good. You know, howling like a wolf when there's no wolves around. That's like, whoa, you know, it's, it's, it's no, no, no. We, we can't be doing that anymore. We're, 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 we're in the nurturing cycle. We're not in the nature cycle. We're in the nurturing cycle. We're in the, the nurturing law, the natural law, the universal law. And that's what, if, if we stop reading books so much as un start understanding what the nurturing is happening, that's all we need. And then we can, we can th those opportunities, as you say, those op op um, optimisms open up. And you see there's so much intelligence out there that you are actually part of that. Instead, we've intellectualized ourselves away from the intelligence. We, we are able to move into our hearts and, and, and live through that applied intelligence. Then it, we we're talking about the fear of death. The fear of death then transforms itself, doesn't it? Because I, I do feel my view is that uh, a, lot, a lot of what's happening now is being led by the fear of death and the way that we are reacting and acting. But within the, the exist, within this um, way of being that we're speaking about, where we're in tune with the earth and we are of the earth and the earth is of us, then that fear of death transforms itself, doesn't it? It changes something else. Wow. Yeah, that's, a, that's another good one. Um, the fear of death without ever thinking about what fear means, right? We're just going to the death part and we're not really working with the fear. And once you understand fear, then there would be no fear of death. Um, and I think there's a process of, of regimenting that goes on in the Western Hemisphere that I didn't get enough, and that's why I, I don't know who I am. Therefore, I'm, I'm, I don't want to die because I don't feel like I've accomplished enough according to the system. Um, I didn't get to have kids. I didn't get to have a big house. I didn't get to travel. I didn't get to do any of those things. So we're sticking the lit, stuck in the... We're, yeah, we're slowed in the regimented system of death. I know I'm going to die someday. We make a big philosophy out of it. Um, but we fear what we have to think about. So we avoid what we think about. And there becomes the fear. And fear, to me, is the illusion. Fear is something that we don't know how to deal with because it's uncontrollable. But when, when we know these these uh, spirit beings or beings of that we would consider fear in this language is it is a being and how much are you feeding this how much are you afraid of it because you're not you're afraid of yourself well the fear of self is the biggest death you see and if you don't know yourself then you're going to ask me well how do you get to know yourself that's not up to me because each of our walks has beings in this form are, are we find different paths to do that not as individuals but more or less the cosmology that it's already made for you and not that it's its property or your its property that you you understand that consciousness rather than the conscience that you actually don't have to do or do the right or the wrong thing now wow i'm just finding that English has so <clears throat> the least language to express myself with. It just, it's, uh, I'd say about 90% of my language in Lakota can't be translated into English. So I'm doing my best to work inside while 
being outside of the box. So fear is is part of denying that. And I, if they're fearing that, then why not get with it? Understand fear not from an analytical side, but actually understand um, what is a, what is fear. If you step on an ant, is that ant going to fear you? Is 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 this why animals run from the humans? If they fear if they fear us. We apply what they we think they're thinking or what they're doing. And the Western Hemisphere does that, or the Western world, the Westerners do that to us. They know what's good for us, right? They say, well, if you don't do this, you're not going to get so-and-so. And so we apply that thinking, that dominant thinking to all life, and it's not working. So fear is applied the same way, and it's spread through the illusion of media that is the truth. And, and I'll go back to that the earth does not lie. And the languages that we have do not lie. So is, it, is fear included in that? Or does, does fear give you the consciousness that life will never end anyway? Oh, maybe it's just this form, but it's energy. And if, and if, our, if our language is light, not just light and love and whatever that, that saying is in the New Age circles, it's actually light. And that light is on forever. And that's what the fear from it is that we, we think that going dark is bad for us. But from the dark, you see that light easier. And if we're always in the light, you can never see the darkness. So positive and negative, I don't know if that works anymore. So it's the balance. The intellectual um, is either one side or the other. The intelligence is what is between the lines. You see, um, are we Republicans or are we Democrats? And someone asked me that, and I said, no, I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not an American, I'm not what you say I am. So if I'm not Democrat or Republican, that means I'm indigenous. I don't have to be either. Indigenous is that empathy. We all know and feel it's in our DNA. And that empathy is the seed to being indigenous. Not just some, we're all indigenous to the earth. No, if you feel it, because I know people without empathy. I see them every day without empathy. They're, they're working off death. And that's, that's the disease. That's what allows um, the fear of something as so natural as a virus, when there are billions of viruses on earth to control. See how small we are? Mm. You were speaking earlier about um, uh, uh, humans having five years. What did you mean by that? Um, if, if humans go accordingly to this time construct, and if they say the Maya, or they say the Kogi, or they say the peoples uh, that have held their ground in sustainability rather than sustainable development that you find that um, they have been thriving. And then when the idea of growth came in as growth in capitalism, growth in democracy, growth, yeah, you see, expanding. That was not, a, a, that, that's not a native idea. So when I think about thriving, it's a maintaining, being happy with what you have, what's been given to you. And the others are looking for growth. Let's grow the movement. Let's get bigger. But there's no, no um, quality to it. There's only quantity. Um, so when I think about five years, it's the cycles of the earth. It's not just summer or whatever, but it's the cycles of those people who have been watching and observing and keeping track, not just for 26,000 years or 50. That our, our knowledge of how long, how long we've been here as Native people, it's beyond comprehension of the Western Hemisphere because they based everything on their birth of their Christ, uh, the Western world, upon their, their Christ, B.C., A.D., or whatever. And ours is, is beyond that and goes forward. And, you know, we, we know how long we've been here. We know that all land was one. 
we, we have that in our stories. We know that where we came from, we, like, it's a long story of cosmo, cosmology. Um, so when I say five years, I'm taking what I know of the prophecies, which are punitive, by the way. The native prophecies is not about punitive. It's we've lived through this before and we, we expect this to happen, not predict. So we know that one way of living with Earth is called world, and world only means a, a way of living. But it's not the end of Earth, you see. So people are afraid of a way of living. It's called the world. Well, the Earth and the planet are going to continue. So either we, we put our feet in the ground or keep our head in the stars, you see. And I think now it's time to put our hands and then our feet in the ground so that we understand what she's trying to tell us. We upload the, the knowledge, the wisdom, the anachopta, to listen, you know, with, with this, this, this transmitter, this uh, receiver that we have, this whole body, the brain, the whole cell, the, the universe, the, the cosmology. And it, again, it's difficult to say these things because they begin to sound new agey. Yeah. But it's very practical, and I know it is. And, you know, I, I really admire the people back home, you know, the, the young people, are, especially in the women and all the people. Because the elders did and have done what the young people are doing now. But the young people are starting to lose track of the elders and say, the American, oh, we don't have, you know, whatever. But the American children, the young, the youth, the youth do not have elders. That's why they always want to trust in the science, right? And I say, no, it's not trust in science. It's trust in the earth because earth will change your science every time. So it's, it's like science is keeping track of something of how we can sustain ourselves in the earth, but the earth is going to do away with science. It's going to, we're going to move beyond. So when this time of purification and awareness arrives, in a sense, in five years, that's when we'll truly know what T. Yokozin is talking about, what Native people are talking about, what he, we have been talking about, and that we'll always be here. Because as long as there are life, my friend would say, we will be here. As long as there is, there is life, we as indigenous folks will be here. So the purification for you is, is not what's happening now? It is. It is. Uh, it, it's, it's, the earth is happening physically. You could see it. Visibly, you could see it. But it's also happening within us. Our consciousness is one of earth. And it's the consciousness of earth that's, that, that um, compelled Extinction Rebellion. So when I first saw that statement a few years ago, I signed it. Right under, I think it was Vandana Shiva, and there, there that came out of the UK. I signed it right away because I understood the feeling of it. And the, the circle with the little hourglass, that's a Lakota sign. That means so above is so below. And so that is a Lakota sign. And if anything, I said, okay, but there maybe they, they won't see this. Maybe they'll just say it's an hourglass or whatever and attribute to a time. It's time. But we understand that it's always happening cosmology within, cosmology without. It is one, no separation. So this is why I signed it. And that awareness is here. And it's if we find a consciousness as, as close as even not stepping on a net, it's not a religion. It's just giving respect to other life forms. So if you were to fast forward, I guess this is, I'm very mindful of the fact that I'm speaking from my intellect, but if you were to fast forward 20 years, how would you hope that you would, that humans would be behaving uh, in alignment with the earth? I think more cultural aspects, um, civilizations, I won't say will die, I think they will shift in, in, in a growth pattern that, that has been given to the manifest destiny of the West here in America. Um, and I don't think it will be America anymore. Um, it's not tragic. It's because we've seen our mistakes in a sense. And I think as a human species, we, we have no choice but to see our mistakes. And whether we 
we we um, repeat those mistakes, that's not up to me. I, I I would like to be around, but then again, I think this is a great time. Wow, this is the, the greatest time to be on Earth with the Earth because all the changes you're seeing. Because I understood what was going on in the '60s and '70s, and you know the wars and wars. It seemed like well, aren't people tired of war? I mean, we we didn't originally have the word for war in our language. Now we had to make one up. You see how much we had to change to adapt because they said that we had to. Now we don't have to do that anymore. And the earth doesn't have to, to do what humans in, in the dominant form says it has to do. She's like, she doesn't even have to fight back because it's like, ah, yeah, that's fine. Thanks for trying, but here's the way. And I think that that awareness is in place. We can't fight it anymore. Why try it? We're not the dominant, the supreme species. We're the last ones here. We're the last ones here. That means we're the most ignorant ones. We're not the most supreme ones because we can blow up things or go to another space or have books or virtual reality. That's just like, that's so small compared to, to cosmology. And, and there's no way that you can own all the knowledge. There's no way that you can own all the information because it's endless. The dimensions that, that described within our quantum physics languages of native people. Now, say I'm saying native people, not civilizational languages that describe dogma and, and authority in that way. I'm saying the quantum physics of native people goes with less words and more intuitive value. Intuitive thinking, indigenous thinking process is more of that. Because if I say... Midakoe Oyasi, if I say mini, if I say this word mini in the alphabet of, of English, M-N-I, it, it doesn't mean just water, right? It, mini means, the M of mini means that which is related between you and I and all things. The ni is living and the E is voicing. They're voicing the living relationship between you and I and all things. And that's how we know what water is. It's a consciousness. It's an intelligent consciousness. So we refer to that, give it great respect, when we just don't subjugate it by saying, oh, that's water. We know the process of it. So it's in our languages. And again, I'll go back to that. It's in our songs that we've, <clears throat> we've completed and Pick up again in creation stories. The creation story, not in the beginning, but it's always a creation story when, when we are, um, I don't know, performing one of our ceremonies. Every ceremony has a creation story in it, and ours does. And we've maintained this and sustained these ceremonies for eons beyond religion, beyond, beyond war, and, and it's there. And how do I take all of that and try to put it into a small language of English that only speaks of, of this? I know how do I say that now? Um, it speaks of from here to here, right? It's a wall, it's in front of you, and you define everything through that, like the book behind me. Now, that, that's the least of expression. Now, I'm going to speak in Lakota. Teokasi. See, here's another way of speaking and seeing the world. But this is the expressive way to, to, to say things. It's just simple like that. You know, maybe people will laugh at that. That's good because maybe it makes them nervous that things can be so simple. My heart aches to, to be in that place. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jason. That was beautiful. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. And uh, yeah, please stay in touch with us. I will. This is, this is good to be here. Thank you again, Carrie, and for the people behind you and support and to all the people that, that we won't hear of, but we'll see their names again and let's let's speak again. That'd be great. Thank you for this interview. It's very okay. been very good for me to, to hear this. Yeah. Thank you very much from my heart. Be well. Okay. I will. Okay. Bye, Tixin. Bye.